Good evening, friends. It's indeed a pleasure to organize this next session, technical session, INA technical session today. The uh, topic of the session has been communicated to you. I would request the host to put it up on the uh, on, on the screen to share it. Uh, and uh, we do have quite a few participants already. Uh, the uh, session is also being uh, set, being projected live uh, on YouTube. The uh, title of the session is Glimpses into the Innovation Potential of the Emerging Decarbonized and Blue Economy, the Ocean Ecosystem. Mr. N. R. Krishna Kumar, former Director of Operations, DNB Business Assurance, along with his colleague, Mr. Subhendu Biswas, founder and CEO of the Green Growth Planning Consultancy. They are going to make this presentation. We are very privileged to have Vice Admiral B. Kandan, PBSM, ABSM, BSM, retired Indian Navy, and previous uh, chairman of the uh, Larsen and Tubro Shipbuilding. And the session will be chaired by Professor N. R. Mandal ex-professor, retired professor from IIT Kharagpur. So it is my privilege to introduce the uh, session uh, chief guest and the session chairman, Vice Admiral Kandan, PBSM, ABSM, BSM, completed his BE in electronic and electronics engineering from College of Engineering, Trivandrum in 1973. He subsequently did his MTech from IIT Bombay and his MBA from Jamnabal Bajaj, Jamna, Jamnalal Bajaj Institute, Mumbai. He held many ch challenging appointments in the Indian Navy, including that of Program Director of India's Nuclear Submarine Program for nearly four years, during which INS Arihant was launched. He retired from the Apex post of the Chief of Materials for Technical Officers in the Indian Navy. During his 40 years of naval service, he was conferred with three presidential awards, ESM, AVSM, and PBSM for his distinguished services. After retirement, he worked for the corporate sector as MD and CEO of Lassen Tubros Shipbuilding at near Chennai for almost five years. Presently, he is settled down at Coimbatore. Incidentally, uh, Mrs. Uh, Kandan, Rear, his wife, Rear Admiral Nirmala Kandan, AVSM, is also an admiral with the Indian Navy, making them the first admiral couple of the Indian Navy, I presume. It's very uh, nice to have you with us, sir. Thank you very much. The session chairman for today is, going to, is Professor N. R. Mandan. Uh, he is from the 1976 batch of naval architects from IIT Kharagpur. After graduation and a brief stint of three years at GRAC, he went on for higher studies. On return with PhD from Technical University of Gdansk, very difficult to pronounce, Poland, <laughs> joined his alma mater uh, as the faculty member in the Department of Naval Architecture. Now it is called Department of Ocean Engineering and Naval Architecture in 1987. Since then, till his superannuation, he continued in the department with his academic pursuits along with various administrative activities at IIT Kharagpur, head of the department, dean of students affairs, member board of governors of IIT Kharagpur, etc. Apart from his regular teaching, Professor Mandel's prime focus of research has been welding distortion and control. As it appears, it is an area very close to his heart. He has published several research papers, produced PhDs, conducted short courses for various shipyard engineers, both in India and in UK, carried out several government-funded research projects as well. In all these, focus remained distortion, welding distortion and control. He has published four books on ship construction, distortion control, line heating, and aluminum welding. Very nice to hear that, sir. Thank you very much for being able to uh, join. Now he has settled uh, in Kolkata, 
uh, peacefully and enjoying a retired life. I would, it is my privilege to uh, hand over the, uh, you know, the session to Professor Mandal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's a great opportunity to come to know all people, uh, though not uh, very directly, but well, this has become the so-called new normal. I would say this also a direct interaction with uh, Admiral Annan and with uh, people like Mr. Kumar Shubhendu and others. It's a great honor for me that you invited me to uh, chair this session. Indeed, it's a very interesting and very, very, very uh, uh, topic uh, that is uh, becoming very close to the heart, as I say, of everybody today. So I take this opportunity without going further uh, in this uh, to introduce Mr. Krishna Kumar. Krishna Kumar happens to be the first batch of QSAT uh, of Cochin University, 1980 batch, BTEC Naval Architecture. Uh, and subsequently, uh, on, on, on graduation from uh, QSAT, he has spent, had a small stint as a lecturer in the de department of his alma mater. And subsequently, in uh, 1983, till 1990, he was with IRS, Indian Register of Shipping, as ship and officer surveyor. And then proceeded to DNV and had a longer, much longer stint of around, I see, 24 years as ship surveyor and business assurance. So uh, he was the uh, former director of operations of DNV business assurance with long experience in ship construction, ship surveying, independent third party services to the offshore and oil and gas industries. The last decade of his professional career that went while in DNV as uh, involved in the business assurance, it was related to management systems, certification, and new service introductions in India and Middle East. Currently, he is the founder of the Easy Pro. That's very interesting, Krishna Kumar Hindi, that an innovative software as a service platform for QHAC management systems and is also involved with healthcare and many industry sectors. So this is it though it's not, not only uh, is serving the marine industry, but also diversifying in healthcare. Excellent. So uh, he'll be our, uh, he'll be presenting uh, today's uh, in this, uh, webinar, uh, which was already introduced by Mr. Tash Gupta. And it will be, he will be uh, uh, the co-presenter, I, I may say, would be Shubhendu Vishwas. He is uh, a process technologist and clean tech professional, former key member in BNB Climate Change Services, founder and CEO of Grid Growth Planning Consultancy. He is involved in the coordination and management of carbon asset development activities, micro hydro projects, energy based sustainable water solutions, and introduction of waste management solutions, such as new technologies like landfill gas capture, energy management systems. His consultancy is involved in helping firms in assessing and managing climate change related risk and ESG disclosure of corporate strategy to mitigate the risk to the stakeholders. He had uh, experience, uh, he had been involved with various organizations like Reliance Petroleum from 96 to 99. Then he was with the Holdia Petrochemicals from 99 to 2004, DNV Climate Change 2004 to 2008, first climate in year 2008 to 2017, and in seven, 2017, he founded his Green Growth Sustainability Services through his Green Growth Planning Consultants. So I welcome both this, uh, our uh, today's very distinguished speakers, Mr. Krishnakovar and Mr. Biswas, to 
take the platform and uh, I uh, and uh, you may get on uh, delivering your lecture. Uh, it shall be. I'm sure we all will be uh, enlightened very much in this very important area of today's world. Thank you. So, uh, may I request Mr. Krishna Kumar? Yeah. Uh, can I share my slide? Yeah. Yeah. So, respected chairman, Professor Mandel, thank you for the kind words and nice introduction. And uh, Rear Admiral Kernan, very pleased that you are gracing this occasion. And uh, I must uh, thank Das Gupta for having given me this opportunity. We were colleagues uh, in the past, and I had some hesitation when he said, please talk about uh, you know, climate change. And then I said, I don't think I'll be able to do it myself. I need Subindu Bishwas, who was my colleague since 2004, when we set up in DNV, uh, a center of excellence for climate change. Those were the days when the clean development mechanisms came. And we had set up a, a group of people, we're all process technologists and from other industries, and set up this climate uh, clean development mechanism center of excellence where they were vetting projects all over the world. This was for carbon credits and uh, things like that. I said, if I, if, he's a, if I can convince him to come, uh, though this may be a shipping oriented group, uh, then he readily agreed. And that is how, you know, then we put together what we should talk about. So we will, uh, so I will try to limit myself uh, to some core shipping kind of uh, topics while uh, uh, Subindu certainly will be able to throw more light on climate change and maybe financing and whatever questions that may arise. Now, when we put, uh, put uh, this topic together, we had mentioned about innovation potential. Now, you see, you can't talk about innovation just in the air. So there has to be a, a project approach, how to fund the projects. So we, that this is not going to be the potential of the, the coverage of this, uh, talk, this particular session. But we will more talk about what all things are happening. Because while discussing with Subindu, I came to understand a lot of things between the ammonia economy, the hydrogen economy, because as naval architects, we are not that, the fuel supply chain is, we are not very familiar with the fuel supply chain. We are okay with the, you know, tank to the propeller that we understand the burning and the, but the very fact after doing a little bit of research, I, I came to conclude that possibly we are going to be at the beginning of the biggest change ever in shipping and in every other industry. So that is be what the net zero world, net zero carbon world is what we are trying to paint the picture. What does this net zero carbon world mean? So that will be the backdrop of it. And there will always be opportunities or threats, but we're not going to go into depth on this, but this is itself is a big change. But like shipping has moved from sail to internal combustion engine. Now after internal combustion engine, what is it's a little bit of a speculative thing, so but I'll try to you know put something here and there to bring the context. So before I go into this this particular slide, everybody is very clear that people keep asking me if shipping is only three percent of the global CO2 emissions, why there is so much of a pressure on shipping? And somewhere else I read, <laughs> so that rests the case. You know, so there are so many ships that are. 70,000 ships are there, and one ship is equal to 70,000 cars of CO2 emissions. You know? Then you can see the kind of impact the shipping has overall. And then it comes to NOx and SOx, shipping has got a, a big impact. On it. Anyway, now the question of why we should have climate change or what is climate change, that question is now rested. Now it's only how and what may, might happen. So my focus will be mainly on those kind of areas. And mainly, I will also not be touching. I wanted to put a kind of a, a you know boundary of what we will be mainly focusing on this energy transition. What is the new type of energy coming, and what are they? 
and how that will come and some ideas on it. Then of course, Das Gupta wanted me to touch upon blue economy. Then when I really went and looked into it, it is such a vast ocean. <laughs> so uh, I will just touch a few things, but I will again try to limit our, uh, this thing to energy transition aspects of the blue economy. So it will be more technical than because I understood this is such a vast topic. You know, uh, in fact, it's the biggest umbrella on which even shipping exists, the blue economy. So I may not do justice, but nevertheless, I can guarantee you, I'll open your eyes to an area which even I never knew maybe a few months back, you know, a couple of months back. Now shipping, now this IMO, uh, IMO has come out with, you're all familiar with this diagram. And in every seminar, this diagram is put up. But the challenges of shipping is the low carbon options really doesn't exist as of now. Too many low carbon options doesn't exist. And these ships are 25 to 30 years life, life cycle. As the depreciation goes up, the ships make maybe more money. You know? So there is no incentive to scrap the ship. So unless this whole forces come in, business as usual can make continue. But from the looks of it, now this force is there. Many ships will get scrapped. Many ships will get built. On, on the other way of looking at it is that this is a great opportunity for India. Because Indian fleet, when I passed out, they said we had 3% or something. The Indian fleet was 3%. Now it is even it is reduced to half of that. So Indian fleet has only diminished over the years. So there's a great opportunity for the Indian fleet to build. and Build it, build it in line with these new things. So I, I want to go back to my first slide. So though I will talk about the net zero carbon world, we will talk about the blue economy, but everything is on the basis of this mantra you keep hearing now from every world leader, we will build back better. We are going to build back better after the COVID. So what does it mean? And it is no doubt a low carbon world. I'm convinced that what they are meaning is build back better is not the old world, it's a new world. And what is this new world is what I hopefully will touch during this session. Okay. Now here, this diagram is well known, So I, but what is the meaning of this diagram? This is also very often you see in the shipping. So it means up to 2030, nothing significant is going to happen except in the energy efficiency area. New fuels may not come in the next up to 2030. But our focus is mainly on the energy transition and the new fuels and new designs, which will be 10 years from now. So we are really talking a little long term, not tomorrow's EEDI or EEXI implementation. We are not going to talk about that. So here, what this, this says is that though uh, logistic activities like slow steaming, the waiting time in port getting reduced, uh, energy efficiency will continue. A naval architecture design, propeller, all those things will continue. But the real big things will happen when the energy transition happens. So my focus is mainly on this energy transition and its connection to the blue economy. So I want to make the, make the library and the, the boundary clear because uh, you have to somewhere draw the line on this whole thing because it can go all over the place. In fact, uh, during the preparation for this, I chance to see Fiki has done tremendous amount of work. They have even got a publication called Vision 2025 for Blue Economy. Uh, and there are many other organizations working on it. And it is so vast. Uh, so it is in the scope of this short time we have, it's not possible for me to do. So, and then since I said, we are going to do this glimpses, I have made a lot of small, small videos because it's very difficult to, explain this without a video. So I have picked from the public domain, whatever I'm showing here, it's all from the public domain. I've made clips of just the essential bit so that you understand what is the essence of what we're trying to communicate. So I've packed in quite a few things. I hope we will be able to you know, do justice to the time being. So energy, efficiency option, waste, waste reduction option from a climate perspective. From an, uh, it's a waste energy efficiency. Already you've got you know, the brown fuels and you are reducing the waste to reduce, mitigate the CO2 emissions. So there's a lot of stuff going on in the shipping arena. 
and now the EEXI is going to come, that will also have. So at the end of the day, it's all about carbon intensity index. So you're looking at what is a ton per CO2 emissions per ton, ton mile. And this kind of indexing is very common in the other industries, which I'm sure uh, uh, Subhendu Bishwas will talk about. Energy efficiency, ship design, that also I won't be talking too much about it, but yes, little bit I will touch about fuels, consumption, operational measures. So these are a design and operation is not also the scope of it. A little bit of innovations I'll talk about short she electric solar ships that I will show you through. And it's a, it can say it's a big innovation. And also, there will be a talk in the future about door to door emission. Shipping somehow has been you know, uh, from port to port, it will no more be port to port. It will be door to door. So how do you integrate though? There comes the role of digitization. So which door to door emissions will be what? See, if you look at it now, who's the biggest world's largest shipper, non-vessel owning container user? It is Amazon. And Amazon can easily do a door-to-door -door emission control. Shipping will contribute the door. Whatever they're doing till the end, they can easily do that, you know, if they want to compute the carbon footprint. So these kind of innovations will happen. Then, of course, we will spend quite a lot on the alternate fuel transitions. So now, with this small introduction, I will invite uh, Subendu to take over and talk about a little bit about this whole climate change regime from which all this has come in. Uh, of course, shipping is used to a lot of regulations coming in. We had the Marpol for a long time. But from a climate change perspective, can you please uh, come on uh, and start from this slide on just to explain the context of this? Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so I'll uh, give you a little glimpse about this climate change thing that's that's been around you know people keep asking as to so when did this whole thing start when did the ball start rolling in fact uh, it's been there for quite some time but then we all look uh, basically to 1992 which uh, was the earth summit at rio which triggered the formation of uh, the unf triple c the united nations framework convention on climate change so uh, so actually that was the third in line so every 10th year so it started from 72 and then uh, it went in 82 and then it was in 92 that this resolution came when we had the first uh, cop we say cop is the confederation of parties uh, we know this year the cop is going to be in uk uh, and that's a very crucial one because that will decide the fate of uh, cdm the clean development mechanism the one which we are familiar with under the kyoto protocol so uh, a little uh, on kyoto protocol basically what happened is that uh, the whole world got divided into two parts. One was the developed countries and one were the developing countries. The developed countries were given some targets, a target to reduce the emissions over a timeline uh, with respect to a baseline year. Uh, so the average target was around 8%. And there were several mechanisms which were formed in order to be able to reach the target. Now, one of the mechanisms was clean development mechanism, the one that we're all familiar with. But then clean development mechanism, originally the concept was a developing, it's, it's like uh, having a finite resource in a, you know, infinite demand scenario, wherein if you put in $1 to improve uh, carbon, uh, reduce carbon emissions in, the U in a developed country, the amount of emissions that you reduce is much lesser if you invest the same into a developing country, because the developed country is supposed to be at a much higher level of efficiency as compared to a developing country. So you achieve higher emission reduction if you uh, invest that equivalent amount in an underdeveloped or a developing country. So that was the prime uh, driver of forming the CDM route of uh, fulfillment, which is a developed country could invest in a developing country uh, in any clean project, which resulted in emission reductions and they claim against those emission reductions as a part of their national contribution, you know, the amount of emission reductions that they were supposed to achieve under the Kyoto Protocol. But there was a second part of CDM, which is a developing country could unilaterally also invest without taking an investment from a developed country. And the amount of emission reduction that they achieve, they could trade 
in the open market, which was the carbon credits. But uh, that is what constituted around 95% of the projects under the CDM uh, till date. So that is what came on the Kyoto Protocol. So the Kyoto Protocol had has its positives and negatives. Uh, there were countries like the US who with, which withdrew in 2001, uh, and then came in the global recession in 2008. And we were expecting a lot out of the Copenhagen summit in 2009, which did not go well. But then came the Paris Agreement, which was in 2015. So the Paris Agreement is uh, basically, it doesn't give a stricture on any of these countries with respect to reduction of targets. It says everyone has to voluntarily act to reduce emissions. The overall target is we have to reach at a point wherein the growth or the rise in temperature in the atmosphere should be limited to two degrees centigrade only. Now, there is a new path that's called a two degree centigrade pathway. That is also at times it says 350 ppm pathway. Now, that is what is 350 ppm? That's the concentration of CO2 that is in the atmosphere wherein it results in a two degree rise in temperature. Now, there is an aggressive pathway which everyone is looking forward for which results in the net zero concept, which results in a carbon neutrality concept, which is 1.5 degree. So now everyone wants to go target one and a half degree rise in temperature, not two degree, so that in the worst case scenario, we land up with a two degree rise in temperature. So the beauty of the Paris Agreement is that it gives a flexibility for every country to define their own means to achieve these targets. So. But as Krishna Kumarji said, everything is now futuristic. What is the pathway that we are going to take and where are we going to land up in the next uh, 30 years, 40 years or 70 years? Because no one is talking beyond 2050 to 2060 because that is when the fate would be decided. If we start acting now, we might do something by 2050. If we start acting late beyond 2050, we say it's a point of no return. We, whatever might be done, we are never going to come back to the state that we want to do. Now, going to the next slide. So, uh, there's a lot of questions on what are this car? What is this carbon credit or carbon trading mechanism? Now, worldwide there are generally two forms of carbon trading that happens. One is a cap and trade. The second is a project based mechanism. What is cap and trade? Cap and trade means every company depending on the type of uh, the area where it is, or uh, the type of product that they manufacture or the segment that they're in are allowed to emit a certain amount, which are called uh, allowances. That is they for the year 2021 would be allowed say 100,000 ton of CO2 to be emitted because of the business that they're into. Now, how much they actually emit is calculated at the end of the year by way of accounting. And if they have emitted more than what they have been given as allowances, they have got to buy it from somebody. So they can either buy allowances in the market when they're traded, or they can buy it from a, another party who has emitted less than what they're allowed to emit. So if I am given 100,000 allowances and I actually land up emitting 80,000, I have 20,000 credits which I can trade. And if someone has 120,000 of emissions against 100,000 of allowances, this 20,000 he needs to source from the market in order to demonstrate compliance. Else the penalty is very high. So he's gonna either go to the market to buy the allowances or he's gonna buy from the guy who has got 20,000 credits because he's emitted less than what has been, he's been allotted. That's the cap and trade. Now the cap and trade is generally done on a national level where the governments decide how much of allowances to be given for which uh, industry. And then they keep squeezing over the period of time. So you have to reduce as over 20% or 30% over the next 15 years. I'm going to slowly keep reducing the allowances which are given out every year. So then you have got to comply with that in order to be able in line with the allowances that's given. Else you have got to buy it from somebody. The other is a project-based mechanism. In a project-based mechanism, if you undertake a clean project which results in emission reduction, you compare it to your business as usual scenario or your baseline scenario. That's what we say baseline emissions. 
That is, if you had not done that project, what would have been the emissions? You compare it with what has been the emissions post implementation of the project, which we say is project emission. The difference between the two are emission reductions, which are tradable. Now, obviously, in order to be able to qualify these emission reductions as credits, which can be traded in the market, you have got to demonstrate a lot of uh, things like their permanent. Now, permanence is a big issue. For example, we have been just uh, talking that there are certain companies who are in oil and gas sector who are thinking of injecting CO2 into abundant mines for either enhanced oil recovery or just to contain the CO2 into the, in those areas. Now, there is an issue of permanence. That is, how long is this CO2 going to be remaining within that formation? Is it going to leak out? What is the rate at which it is going to leak out? Is it going to form with water, the carbonic acid, and go out? So these are permanence issues. For example, uh, I don't know, you must have been hearing of a concept called nature-based solutions, which is there, which is now doing rounds. That is, in order to go into the low carbon trajectory, how we can use nature, we can change the way we cultivate agriculture. We plant more trees uh, for mitigation as a mitigation option. Now, there is also an issue of permanence. That is, if I have an agricultural setup and tomorrow there is a natural disaster and that rolls back the whole thing that I've done. So it is not permanent. So there is a degree of uncertainty into this. So uh, unless we prove that these credits are permanent, unless we prove these credits are beyond business as usual, unless we prove that we need the carbon credit money in order to continue doing carrying the business, these credits can't be sold in the market. So these are ways of demonstrating them and going. So these are the two basic mechanisms how the climate, uh, the carbon fading happens and the mechanism there. Now going to the next slide. Yeah, so, so, shall yeah. I skip this? I mentioned this in the previous one. Okay, we can go straight here, yeah. Right, so, uh, so there are uh, different uh, technologies which we talk of when we talk of uh, you know clean fuel we talk of alternate fuel there is something called a green hydrogen now there are different classifications of hydrogen we say gray hydrogen we say blue hydrogen we say green hydrogen the same goes for ammonia we say green green ammonia we say blue ammonia we say gray ammonia we say turquoise ammonia now the difference is if you make hydrogen from a hydrocarbon source steam by reforming, there is an emission of CO2. So that's the normal conventional hydrogen, which is gray. If you can capture the CO2 emitted in the process and sequester, that is blue. But if you can make hydrogen from a source which does not emit any carbon, for example, if you emit by electrolysis process, you produce hydrogen using power, which is 100% renewable, that is green. So these are different ways of uh, saying how, what is green, what is blue, what is gray. The same for ammonia. So green hydrogen, green ammonia, biofuel, methanol, batteries, nuclear are the different energy sources which are being talked of now as, in, as clean fuel for the future. So these are the problems. This is only a glimpse to show that the green hydrogen and ammonia dominates the, the discussion now. They are told to be the fuel of the future. More so about ammonia, because the energy density is much more. It can be done at a lower temperature. And so it is much better than hydrogen. So, but then in terms of maturity, in terms of advantages, disadvantages, you'll find each of them has their plus as well as the minus with respect to their future goal, but it's it's in the developmental process. If you go to the next one, uh, this will give you a, a glimpse of what are the main barriers or the, uh, you know, the, the or that, that is preventing this sector that we are talking of, the shipping sector, the maritime sector from go, going into the next uh, league. So there can be, Although there is the market demand, it can be regulatory incentives, it could be technological alignment, it could be clarity on the roles and decision making, it can be about the ease of asset replacement, it can be there about the ease of infrastructure replacement. So there are several barriers to it. The ones which are in red are the major barriers. For example, regulations, if we say 
uh, are there any binding regulations about carbon emission process? We know that in the aviation sector, we can say, yes, there is a binding regulation now from ICAO, uh, which we say as Corsia, wherein all aviation uh, players have to comply, have to all the, even the infrastructure like the airports and all have to comply. They've got to compute the emissions. They have to keep reducing the emissions. So there, there are requirements of binding regulations, which wherein all players are motivated to be able to take up projects, to take up uh, you know, uh, innovations, to be able to reach that goal that they're aiming for. Markets, is, who's willing to pay? If you are uh, thinking of putting up a project, there's a cost to it, but who's gonna bear the cost of it? Even if you lower emissions, how does it help in terms of your economics? How does it tell in terms of your bottom line? So there are a lot of things, we have a lot of barriers in terms of each of those sectoral you know, policies that prevents from these uh, things to happen. So it's just a glimpse of what are the major barriers which prevents uh, this growth. Okay, so uh, uh, Subindu, now what I'll do is I'll switch on these uh, small yeah. video clips. Yeah. So, yeah. I, let me just put on the video clips. What we are going to show is some small clips going back into shipping on the decarbonization options. As I told, these are all publicly available, uh, you know, things. I just put some small pieces of it so that, you know, it is easy to do. The first one which I'm going to show is an LNG ship. Now, let me just, before I get into this, this is actually from DNV itself. Uh, it is available. It's called the perfect ship. When it says perfect ship, it means piston-free engine room. Just imagine if there is no engine room. In fact, you will come to know that there is no engine room itself will disappear and there is no internal combustion engine. So that kind of designs, this is for a large size ocean ship. What could be a future design? And the modern ULCC, with a capacity of 20,000 containers and more, is perhaps the most efficient transporter of cargo ever devised. But as public and regulatory pressure increases on shipping to reduce emissions to air and shrink its carbon footprint, the question is, can the industry come up with an improved concept? Perhaps even the perfect ship? established a set of goals for perfect to utilize LNG as a primary fuel for an ultra low emissions profile future proofed against regulations covering NOx SOx particulates and co2 in a design with at least the same carrying capacity and efficiency as existing ULCCs this was a challenge as due to its lower energy density LNG powered vessels generally need larger fuel tanks than conventionally powered vessels the team hit on a novel solution, the use of a highly efficient combined gas and electric steam turbine system in combination with an all-electric design. From these goals, the perfect ship got its name. Piston engine room free efficient container ship. The groundbreaking use of an LNG co-gas system gave the project team a great deal of flexibility in the arrangement of the vessel to meet their goals. Propelling the ship with electrical motors enabled the power generation and propulsion systems to be placed in separate sections of the ship. And with the Koga system providing power for both propulsion and auxiliary systems, an engine room was not needed anymore. So the power plant, together with the integrated LNG tanks, could be moved below the deck house, freeing up considerable space for more container slots. In addition to the improved overall arrangement of the vessel, a tailored hull shape and new propeller design add to the overall efficiency. The novel hull form with its vertical bow is tailor-made to the operational profile of the vessel. And with a high efficiency propeller in combination with a contra-rotating pod, the total propulsive efficiency is increased by around 5%, which adds to the overall efficiency of the concept. So here, the main point here is the, though LNG is an interim arrangement, LNG is not considered to be totally green. As we go later, you will understand that maybe the fuel of the future could be ammonia, hydrogen, et cetera. It may not be LNG, 
But for the time being, because LNG fuel supply chain is quite good, you might have these interim suggestions. So what they have proposed here is the engine room is dispensed with, and that space is used for uh, for cargo or if it's a passenger ship, maybe for passengers. So you can have such kind of a changes. Ships are becoming bigger, and so that is another kind of innovation that can come for these large ships. Now, as I mentioned in my earlier this thing, now short sea shipping, because when it comes to climate change, we are talking about door-to-door -door emissions. Now, it is not only the only big ships are very green and uh, fuel efficient, even the local shipping, the coastal shipping must be. So here is again uh, uh, an electric powered short sheet container carrier. This actually, when I retired from DNV, they had published this uh, video. But now I was told Cochin Shipyard has already got an order Though it's not exactly what I'm going to show, it's a Ropax ferry, which they are going to make for Norway. Four of them trailers, uh, but in the similar kind of principle, battery charged uh, autonomous vessel. I, I understand that they are calling it ocean drone. That means there are no people on board. This is a very short video, just to give you the concept. It's another innovation. You can imagine 1,300 ton dead weight with 50 kilowatts. So there is no, so the coastal shipping can benefit quite a lot by these kind of configurations. It is, you know, unbelievable advantage. So you would have noticed that this is also a big innovation where the engine room is disappearing. Of course, when I show this to marine engineers, they get very concerned. <laughs> so what happens if there is no rotating equipment and you know fuel pumps, what so in the ships in the future? Now I'm going to take you to another big innovation. Uh, it is about fuel cell. This technology is just coming in, but fuel cell, we will go a little more deeper into the subject because this would be the absolute future which will come. This is connected to the hydrogen economy and whatnot. But we need to understand what is fuel cell. So first, they are they're showing you that it is not that this is total science fiction. There is already some ships, mainly in the passenger ships, which are fuel cell powered. And there are more coming. So we'll see a few examples of these innovations. So 
now i'm going to i'm going to show you another similar thing of fuel cell this company was founded by an indian mr k r shridhar who passed out from rec trichy he was a professor in arizona and he has come out of this bloom box it is in the now they are coming into shipping just watch this and then we will go a little more deeper into what is fuel cell let us understand has been successfully powering the world on land for 20 years deployed at more than 700 sites globally and now we're taking our technology to the sea to help power the marine industry currently heavy fuels that are used to power the marine transport industry make up to 2 to 3% of global carbon emissions bloom energy is changing that by powering ships with its clean and fuel flexible fuel cell technology that can run on natural gas biogas or hydrogen However, conditions at sea are vastly different from those on land. That's why Bloom's fuel cells are being rigorously tested to ensure optimization for ocean deployment. Pitch, yaw, roll, and vibration. We're readying our fuel cells for sea, eager to provide reliable energy to ships and passionate about reducing global emissions within the marine industry. It's chemical reaction process now, so we understand what how I they will now after showing this video i will ask uh, subindu to explain a little bit about what is fuel cell how does it work use electricity oxygen is added on the cathode side of the cell where it is reduced to oxygen ions these ions then permeate through solid oxide electrolyte to the anode and electrochemically oxidize hydrogen in this reaction we get two electrons as well as water and heat Then there is a part that links cells in series called interconnect and because of the variating temperatures in a stack it must be extremely stable to prevent cracks from forming due to their high heat tolerance most parts in solid oxide fuel cells are either ceramics or metal ceramic composites apart from sustainability potential and hydrogen abundance their advantage is also high energy conversion efficiency which is currently around 60% and with waste heat recovery system could achieve up to 85 but there are still possibilities for improvement such as finding proper cell materials and stack architecture suitable for a lifespan of at least 50000 hours lowering operational temperature to reduce degradation rate and increase efficiency and lastly end product price tag must come down significantly we can conclude that fuel cell technology is already at our disposal And as a proof of concept such cargo ship could be built today without drastic changes in current ship design but for them to become common place there are still engineering challenges and much needed investments so so what i want to show here is this is the replacement 85 a, a box like this which can be stacked is a replacement of the main engine or whatever power source you have and this produces electricity so now i'm going back to the functioning of the of the fuel cell and essentially i will uh, subin and uh, mr vishwas will explain a little bit more on detail essentially you are putting in hydrogen liquefied hydrogen into a kind of a cell like structure and oxygen is the other one coming in you get electricity directly and you the uh, there is no carbon water and heat is produced out so this is the concept so uh, Subindu can you please explain this while i play this yeah okay so basically yeah. these eyes uh, then permeate through so it's 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 basically an electro you know there's an electrolyte with two the you know cathodes and anodes where you have hydrogen coming in now the source of this hydrogen can be anything it can be water it can be reforming of an hydrocarbon it can be uh, uh, any other there are certain other elements as well and you take uh, oxygen you can take it from the air and then we know hydrogen and oxygen combine to form moisture uh, air that is uh, water so you don't have any co2 emissions in this but then uh, there are two main uh, factors here in that is uh, in terms of fuel cell technology uh, if you look around you will find a lot of them uh, so Uh, the one that we were talking of uh, at the end was about solid state fuel cell in solid state fuel cell the temperature is very high that is around uh, 1000 degrees in 1000 degrees what happens is uh, you have uh, although the efficiency is very high it's around 60% plus 
but then you you are uh, you need to take time to start up the whole thing or to shut down but uh, whenever we are talking of a megawatt scale uh, capacity in terms of fuel cell we are basically left with uh, two uh, forms of fuel cell that we say is mcfc and sofc that is molten carbonate or solid oxide state now the other type of fuel cells which we had heard of previously like the polymer electrolyte membrane fuel cell or the alkaline fuel cell or the phosphoric acid fuel cell they generally give from 1 kilowatt to 100 kilowatt to 400 kilowatt but then for uh, shipping and for other utility say, segment and for distributed power generation we always go down to the molten carbonate and the solid oxide which operate at a very high temperature of 600 to 700 to 1000 degrees centigrade so the beauty of this is apart from the fact that you only just need to arrange for the hydrogen uh, the, the whole thing because in certain cases you can in situ produce hydrogen and then uh, you can use it in the fuel cell to generate power and that can be used to drive uh, so you do have no co2 generation you don't need much of a space because they are stacked electrolytic uh, cells so you only need a space for the fuel from which the hydrogen gets generated and then you can use that power it's a clean power that you can use in the uh, for, for motive okay so that's, thank you now what i will do is i will show you an example of an innovative design uh, on using fuel cells it's a small uh, this is a vessel which has already been designed it doesn't take any fuel you can see it's a small boat, smaller boat, but it's been going all over the world. First boat capable of making its own hydrogen fuel from the water underneath it. Meet the Energy Observer. Each day, the Energy Observer produces enough energy to power nine homes for one full day. Once its batteries are full, it stores the extra energy as hydrogen fuel. Hydro the Energy Observer is covered top to bottom in 200 square meters of solar panels, which soak up sunshine from the sky above, as well as from the reflections off the ocean's surface. These solar panels charge up a set of lithium ion batteries for short-term energy storage during the day. Any extra energy is stored as hydrogen made from the seawater below. This is what really makes the Energy Observer special. This is how it works. The Energy Observer pulls up seawater and forces it through a filtering membrane to remove the salt. Then it just takes the H out of the pure H2O with a little help from electricity. The hydrogen is then compressed and stored in tanks to be converted back into electricity once it's needed. While the boat is on the move, it harnesses the power of the wind for maximum efficiency. Those two skinny sails are called ocean wings. The Energy Observer team says the 12 meter ocean wings are twice as efficient as traditional sails, can rotate a full 360 degrees, and are fully automated. The Energy Observer team says that these ocean wings can reduce energy consumption 18 to 42 percent, depending on the conditions. That energy savings is especially significant because it allows the Energy Observer to keep producing hydrogen even while it's moving, whereas before the installation of the ocean wings, it could only do so when stopped. With a crew of 10, the Energy Observer has been proving and improving its self-sufficiency as it has traveled the world since 2015. Okay, now, now we are talking about the fuel creation. The ocean green hydrogen, Mr. Subindu had said, what is green hydrogen? Now, this is about an uh, offshore platform getting converted to produce green hydrogen. And which means existing uh, offshore platforms, when it is no more there, you can convert into green hydrogen from seawater. That particular boat was also using seawater to convert into this thing. This has been done at an industrial scale. This is another innovation. The energy transition is gaining momentum. The Dutch Climate Agreement aims for a 95% reduction in CO2 emissions by 2050. To achieve this, a lot of investments in wind and solar energy are taking place. But these weather-dependent energy sources come with increased fluctuations in the energy grid. To avoid overloading the grid, wind turbines have to be curtailed on some days. Hydrogen could provide a solution. Green hydrogen can be produced offshore with green electricity from wind farms. This way, 
electrons convert seawater into hydrogen, and this is transported to land via the existing gas infrastructure, which has more than enough capacity. When no side in project on the Q13A platform is the world's first offshore green hydrogen project. The Q13A platform operated by Neptune Energy is the first fully electrified oil and gas platform in the Dutch North Sea. It has been chosen by TNO and Next Step for the two-year Poseidon pilot project to produce green hydrogen from seawater. The containerized green hydrogen production facility fits on most offshore platforms due to its small size. While currently powered by a subsea cable providing green electricity from shore, the platform can be directly powered by offshore wind in the future. During the Poseidon project, the fluctuations in offshore wind production will be simulated. The production of green hydrogen begins with the platform pumping seawater into the containerized units. The water is then demineralized and fed into the electrolyzer. The electrolyzer splits the water into hydrogen and oxygen. The oxygen is safely disposed. The green hydrogen is blended into the gas export line. The Poseidon pilot project on the Q13A platform aims to increase knowledge about the production of green hydrogen on offshore platforms and to innovate on existing technologies. Okay, so, so that gave an overview of some of the innovations which can come. So essentially, now in India has also got a national hydrogen policy. And uh, so the national hydrogen, and even I think Reliance has said that they are also going to produce green hydrogen. So hydrogen can very well be the fuel of the future. And with the fuel cell technology, that will be a big revolution. In fact, uh, now I... Will, how can you deal with them? Uh, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. We must have heard of uh, NEOM in Saudi which is an upcoming project uh, wherein the smart, the new city being created there in uh, the sustainable city like Mazdar, uh, which is uh, which is now coming up in Saudi, is going to be fully uh, based on green hydrogen. So, but uh, the, another good development under green hydrogen is now uh, there's a lot of trust of generating hydrogen from uh, biogas, which can be from waste management. So even landfill gas is now being tried out to produce hydrogen. Uh, so it can produce green hydrogen. So there's a lot of parallel uh, activities also going on to produce green hydrogen, uh, which, which involves other sources, uh, uh, you know, not hydrocarbons, like biogas in itself from the waste management sector. Yeah, okay. that was it, thank you. So, so now what I will do is I will now switch to the blue economy or the ocean energy, it's also green energy, the energy transition, that will also play a big role. So let me just uh, go into, uh, just a, with a small brief note, because we have got just a few minutes more, but but I will run those three, at least these thoughts for, for you. Okay, now let, let me talk about this blue economy. We are all familiar with the sea waves buoyancy, stability, everything, we are very, very familiar. But we rarely know under the sea. We, we really do not know much under the sea. But that is the blue economy, and it's a huge opportunity for India with all these areas. But because there are so many areas, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, my intention is not to talk about all these things, but mainly to talk about ocean renewable energy in this energy transition, what kind of role it can play. And if you look at the, in, in India, India is, uh, somebody was telling, uh, or maybe it's a fact, that the, India is the only country in the world who has an ocean named after the country. There's no other country in the world who's got a, but that doesn't mean that we own the Indian Ocean. There are the 29 countries, 39 countries in the Indian Ocean, all of them own the resources of the Indian Ocean. But not only that, Recently, the Indo-Pacific has become a new construct. This is Indo-Pacific. So India is a very key member 
north of the Indo-Pacific area, which means these deep sea areas here, there are the territorial areas. If I look back into my old previous slide, this is the, you know, the territorial areas, the exclusive economic zone, and then the open areas. So there are rules coming in on how, there is a whole set of rules coming. It's a big area of jurisdiction, who can go and uh, there is a whole set of, you know, they, they call it the blue capital of India, the India's capital. So recently I heard one of the minimum, uh, Suresh Prabhu calling, this is the true reserve bank of India. All our wealth is in the ocean, you know, and we are not even tapped it. It is there safe for us. And unimaginable amount of wealth is there in the ocean, but nobody really knows how to go and tap the oceans. So there's a lot of opportunity for possibly naval architects and people associated with the marine environment. So this is the definition Hickey had given in there. So they are talking about resources and assets in the ocean related to rivers, water bodies, coastal regions. They have covered a wider, compared to World Bank has got a, definition which is a little more limited. India has given a very vast definition, ensuring equity, inclusion, innovation, and modern technology. And there's a lot of money going into this. And they have said in their vision 2025, these are the areas. So you can see everything has got a marine uh, attached uh, name attached to it. So which is all opportunities for the marine fraternity in terms of innovation, in terms of business, in terms of all kinds of things. So it is, but I'm going to limit myself totally in the area of energy with this thing, uh, with a few comments on ocean wind farms. Maybe I'll seek also Subindu's help. He has worked with some wind farms, but wind farms by and large has been on the shore, on the land. And we have got it all well tapped. What is the, and there is this question as Mr. Subindu explained, is it business as usual or it is not business as usual? You know, but it is very green. You know, the, the whole thing is renewable energy. So that kind of questions and debates are there. But as you keep going into the offshore, you and these technologies are all known for us. Putting a, pla putting a platform here, we have done on the offshore oil and gas, we have got enough know-how in all these things, tethered, floating. Uh, there's no lack of uh, technology knowledge here. And the wind potential is also mapped. And there is these uh, once in a while, this technology is well developed, the wind farms. Not only is the wind farm developed, ships like this are also available. This is like the offshore vessels when it came, there were these derrick barges, pipe lay barges, all these kind of construction barges which came in. There are already ships like this based on the same technology. So there is nothing new to be invented. We have to only invest them in them. Uh, so then do, I'll just talk a little bit about offshore wind farms before I jump into the other modes of uh, energy. Can I just uh, say something uh, you know, with respect to business as usual and what is not business as usual? Yeah, that, 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 that's a big debatable topic now because with respect to wind, because one of the prime drivers with respect to wind was obviously the fact that there were some uh, tax related benefits, which which voted a lot of industries to move into wind uh, farms and all. Uh, so the, that's why even now, uh, if you look at the world carbon market, uh, renewables, uh, specifically wind uh, and solar has been removed from uh, the eligible projects, which can get carbon credits, both from the voluntary biggest voluntary protocols, Vera, as well as the gold standard protocol. So that is because the technology has matured so much over the period of time that the price of delivery has become comparable with uh, business as usual fossil fuel based systems. So they feel that there's no uh, specific uh, money flow needed from carbon markets to promote wind. Uh, and but then, uh, as Sumaji said, uh, our, one of the biggest assets we have is our shoreline. We have a huge shoreline, uh, which ha has a big capability with respect to offshore wind generations. And, uh, and that has been in discussion for quite some time, but then uh, there have been sporadic, uh, you know, projects going around. But then now it has come in as I say that it has to be a sustained effort to put in more of offshore wind because offshore wind in the Nordic countries is a, is, is a very proven technology and is, a, is the most prevalent one therein. So, and we have such a big uh, shoreline, we can easily go in for that. Uh, so, so offshore wind is, is very much in discussion. Uh, so that is one of the features also in renewable energy. 
Okay, in the next five minutes, maybe, you know, we can see, we'll close with the next thing is on ocean renewable energy, a few examples. And I'll ask Subindu just to say a few, uh, I know, a few yeah. introduction to this before I play the video. Yeah, so when, when we talk about ocean renewable energy, because when we talk of blue economy, uh, actually a little inside that the blue economy term came, started coming in from the SIDC, that is small island developing countries. So when they brought in the, so the fact that there is a huge resource line because they are more dependent on the ocean economy than the land-based economies. So there is a need of sustainably uh, looking at all these resources. Because if you look at fishing also, uh, the, it's, it's said that around 75% of the areas have been either over-exploited. Uh, so there's, there is a need of having uh, proper planning and sustainable way of looking at the ocean resources then when the blue economy came into play. Now, when we talk of the opportunities in the blue economy, so uh, as listed out, there's a huge opportunity, but one of the biggest ideas is renewable energy. And when we talk of renewable energy in the blue economy, there are basically three forms, either the wave form of energy, the tidal form of energy, and the ocean thermal energy conversion. These are the three prevalent ones. The others are only a variant of each of these prevalent ones. So we can go into a little okay, detail so the video. We, we will see the video. It will give you an idea of what only a few, a few you know, examples we have uh, you know, captured. Each module is formed by a 10 meter diameter buoy, which is a 22 meter long mechanic arm and a pump connected to a closed circuit of fresh water. As the wave reaches the modules, the buoys go up and down, moving the mechanic arm, and this movement activates the hydraulic pump, which through a closed circuit injects fresh water kept on high pressure system formed by a hydropneumatic accumulator and a hyperbaric chamber. This system releases a stream with a pressure equivalent to a 400 meters water column, which is similar to a large hydroelectric plant. The pressurized stream of water makes the turbine spin that activates the generator and produces electric energy. We open the side of the converter, we see that the waves have been converted into efficient water pistons. That's why we call it a wave energy converter. This conversion is great because it means that we have captured the waves in several chambers that make it possible to use them for power generation. As you see, there are several pistons working independently, all driven by different wave heights and wavelengths in the ocean. In other words, the converter picks up both small, medium and large waves in the same design. Now that's neat. These turbines always run in the same direction because of the guiding wings. This means that the system will always be operational when there is motion in the ocean. Let's talk about scaling up, because that is the key to success for a green transition. Let's start small. The small, simple, clean and efficient converter units are smart because their size makes them functional, affordable, 
and accessible for all coastal regions. Instead of excluding regions like we do in today's fossil fuel-driven economy, we can include regions based on local wave energy resources so that no one is left behind. In my opinion, this is the way to reach the UN Sustainable Development Goal number seven, affordable and clean energy. The next phase of the scaling up process is to make power plants. The converters are in fact models that can be placed in arrays to form bigger power generating systems where they work together to absorb a lot of energy from the ocean. An example of a complete power plant is the brilliant power pier that you can see here, built in a concrete structure. The floating power pier is a robust solution with multi-purpose features that makes wave energy available, economically viable, and not at least durable, capable of generating clean energy for decades. The final stage of scaling up is to create large wave energy parks. If you install several power piers in the same grid, entire cities and industrial areas can be powered by local and renewable wave energy resources. Step by step, we can replace fossil fuels and start living in balance with our precious natural environment. Okay, uh, actually there is tidal energy, a few more types of energy, but I think for the sake of time, uh, that's good, there was only, if I can take two, three minutes, I would like to show about ocean thermal energy. Uh, or shall we can take it in the discussions later? Because there is a use of ammonia in that. Oh, can I go ahead and- One in the slide, two, right? There is in the slide also, yes. Yeah, we can explain it just in the slide as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. I'll explain it, we, we'll explain it in the, in the, I'll just put the slide up. No, I think, I think it is in the, sorry, it is in the, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll freeze the, uh, freeze it on the, on the, Moving. Yeah, this one, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'll just solar energy stored. Yeah, uh, maybe with this short video, we can you can explain. Thermal energy conversion makes use of the vast solar energy stored in the upper layers of the ocean. Heat from the warmer surface water is used to vaporize a liquid such as ammonia. This rotates a turbine which drives a generator to produce electricity. Deep, colder ocean water cools the ammonia which condenses back to liquid to be heated again in a 24-7, 365 days a year cycle. OTEC energy is best used offshore in very deep water. Ideal locations are found along the equator where the surface temperature can be as much as 30 degrees centigrade higher than the deep water below. Okay. Uh, can you just explain this, uh, Subindu? Yeah. yeah. You can freeze it here. Right? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I think this is the maximum it will go. Yeah. yeah, that's okay. So yeah. basically, the concept is that energy we know that of the total amount of uh, energy that comes onto the Earth's surface, 70% of that uh, lands in the you know ocean, and a significant of, of that is part is absorbed by the top layers of the water. So that is why we get uh, we can easily get a 20 to 20, 30 degree differential in temperature between the top surface of the ocean and the, if we go down deep below. So the, using this temperature difference, we can there's something called an ocean thermal energy conversion process. That is, the hot water is taken from the top. There is an driving uh, fluid in between, which is generally anhydrous ammonia, which is vaporized using that heat because the, then what we need a very low specific heat in order to vaporize. And that is used to turn the turbine, which generates power. And once it's turned, then we use the cold water to convert remnants it back to the initial form. And then it then goes in the same cycle. Now, the best part of it is that this can also be used in conjunction with 
a uh, you know a diesel plant that is in the like in the diesel plant where you use a flashing steam in order to take out the salt from therein there the, the flash steam can be also used to generate uh, in an ammonia cycle or directly to generate power and then that the cold water is used to condense it back right there so the, these are there are two modes of it so one is a single the, the circuit like that or it can also be a hybrid circuit where it, it, we can use both of them together so but then this is one there are some otec installations which are already running for the last 3 4 years and they have been doing quite good and these are in megawatt scale okay so thank you so with that i think uh, it is about a lot of things we covered and maybe i have overshot by about 4 5 minutes uh, so sorry for that i think i've eaten into some other time maybe so with that we close and uh, maybe uh, i think chairman uh, you can lead the way yes i know we were guilty of uh, too many things we packed in <laughs> yes. i told that to das gupta because this is an ocean and we have to stop somewhere <laughs> thank you so much yeah thank you very much uh, this is a really a vast area when we talk about any ocean system yes a big big trap for 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 uh, for our presenter indeed thank you actually i was carried away i mean uh, correctly krishna kumar has mentioned that you have packed in too many things yes what else you can do it's ocean <laughs> that is there you know i mean uh, because uh, just the other day it's a matter of coincidence iit guwahati is uh, uh, will be working on some of the underwater technologies so so uh, there we had been talking about uh, uh, many of the things which are somewhat in common with with what we have seen today so uh, there are many many things so anyway uh, maybe we quickly go to the question uh, if there is any question from um shanoi here shanoi is saying something compliments to the speakers for a most interesting talk many of the new technologies of carbon reduction require new materials and production process okay uh, here is a uh, something from ajit shanoi He is, uh, I believe, currently in Southampton. Uh, let me read it out for for all of us. It's quite a interesting thing he has mentioned that many of the new technologies we have been talking about many technologies uh, for carbon reduction that requires new materials and production stock process. The formal will place a demand on limited naturally available sources. That is the materials. The later that is the new production methods may be energy intensive. so my question is how were policy framers and industry best implementers accounting for this sustainability related facets probably shubhendu can address this yeah yeah actually uh, there is one, one part of that we need to look at uh, say for example we have been talking of hydrogen and we were saying uh, that uh, the source of hydrogen can be water water is not a limited resource for us we have been saying that the source of hydrogen can be biogas which is generated anyway in any waste decomposition uh, you know site which is not a limited resource for us but then yes as you had been saying that it would need a new technology and if you see the transition in the fuel cell technology has been from the initial pfc to now it has come to the solid oxide form that is because uh, we don't want to use uh, the precious metals in the electrolyte uh, lytic cells it has been replaced with polymer material therein and all so the effort is always to go to a point wherein it becomes uh, because if you use precious metal it's not it's not going to come out uh, economical for a large you know deployment of these kind of technologies or not so that is where the whole study is leading to that it has to be sustainable in itself not only in terms of uh, being able to compete with conventional technology using all the uh, naturally available resources but which are not in uh, in uh, conflict of the fact that uh, it is scarce resource so that is where the whole market is moving and in terms of policies all governments are now coming out with policies in order to be able to promote these kind of technology so all innovation funds 
or the uh, the government, for example, we have a hydrogen policy now at the government level. There are incentives. There is a, there was an effort a few days. I don't know whether you have seen that IOC was uh, open to buying any uh, biogas form from plants that have been set up from agricultural waste, which could be which would be bought back to back by IOCL. Because so there are a lot of efforts in the market by corporates to push this kind of projects, this kind of innovations therein. OTEC is also something which is also uh, is there in the Middle East. I've been seeing there are three, four projects already in discussion and they're not three, four, five kilowatt. They are thousands of megawatt. There is already a 500 megawatt project in discussion which is gonna come out in, in uh, Abu Dhabi. So they, they are in discussions and they're all in mega scale. But then yes, the economy of scale is one big thing. And as the technology matures, it also is going to come down to a point where it will be at par with the conventional technology and can replace that. And there are policies and programs for that. Can I can just come in? Professor Shanoi is yeah. already there. So if mm -hmm. Professor Shanoi can unmute and uh, you, you can, you know, if you wish, you can ask the question or... Uh... Please. So I've unmuted. Um, yeah. So thank you very much. I think it's a, first of all, again, a brilliant talk. Uh, you've covered a very wide range of uh, subjects and you've done it so nicely in such a short time. Uh, very understandable. So thank you for that. My question was really about, you know, the it's a more philosophical question, uh, although I put technology and science in there. It's about the consumption. So the tendency is to consume more. And if through development, more of the world's population is going to be consuming more, then clearly the resources are going to be used for such consumption. So that was my question about, you know, new materials coming in for the fuel cells, for example. Um, we will require new materials and those are limited. Polymers, you talked about using polymers. Now, polymers are derived from fossil fuels. So again, that is a fossil-based product. So I'm not sure about the sustainability angle, and that was where I was really leading to uh, about uh, you know what the policy framers and industry implementers are uh, thinking about when they come up with solutions. Thank you. Uh, I, if I may come in, sir, that is uh, there are uh, if I look at a low carbon trajectory or a low carbon uh, strategy, uh, whether it's an organization or it's a country, there are there's a two prone approach. One is reduce energy consumption by way of energy efficiency improvements, uh, bringing in technology which are more, which are less energy intensive. The other part of it is reduce the carbon, uh, what do you say, the carbon intensity of the energy which is used in the process. So one, the renewable part only takes care of the carbon intensity of the energy being uh, driven. The energy efficiency part takes care of the total absolute amount of energy in itself being used in the process or not. So it's always, uh, so one, the renewable only plays one part of it. The other part of it has to be in terms of modernization, improvements, reducing energy consumptions, as you rightly said. So that can only bring in the overall emissions can only come down if we have a balance of both of them together. So Professor Shana, uh, uh, good, thank you very much for uh, pointing out this very philosophical aspect in this, that I also used to uh, think uh, uh, that uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll take this opportunity to, to, to um, narrate a small anecdote uh, written by a Japanese author. I mean, a, a, a small story, the ending of the story only I'll narrate. It says, it's a, it's a scene you try to imagine. It's a, uh, the afternoon, I mean, nearing evening, the dusk, a old man is uh, cutting some uh, something, some wood in front of his house in older days of uh, that is happening in Japan. So one young man comes, uh, one young chap comes there and that old man says, uh, would you please uh, go inside and get me? He asked him to fetch something. So he goes inside comes out and says, it's dark inside. By the time it's already evening has dawned, it's dark inside. Then the old man says, night is for darkness. And the story ends there. What do I mean by this? Is that philosophical aspect what Professor Sharai has uh, somehow uh, wanted to touch upon. The consumption of energy 
overall consumption of energy, probably that happened in the uh, Rio uh, Convention or Kyoto, I don't recall exactly, where there is a real tussle between the developed and the so-called developing world because we are a huge population, but we are contributing, consuming very little energy, thereby producing very little uh, carbon emission, whereas uh, developed countries is huge. So overall, unless we bring it down, we land up in the sustainability issues. Like uh, I would like to point out here uh, regarding materials, uh, we often talk about, now we are talking about e-mobility, e-cards, based on what? Lithium ion cells. Where do we dispose them? How do we manufacture them? What is the carbon? This is what is not a full green power. It is that so-called, as you mentioned, three gradations you have made very nicely. So these are the issues. Anyway, thank you very much, Shivendu. Uh, probably we'll uh, proceed because there are some more questions. Uh, the Shujit Bakshi, yes, yes, come on. Uh, yeah, he's asking, what is the roadmap suggested by you for India? Uh, any roadmap? I mean, uh, Krishna Kumar or Shuvendu who can? No, no. See, the, as direction? far as the green, yeah. Mm -hmm. See, what I believe, mm -hmm. India from a shipping perspective, the yes. energy transition. We have, we don't have a fleet of any any work. We don't have yeah. a reserve fleet. We don't have a main fleet. We have nothing. Now is the opportunity for us because we were so backward that we can go in for these clean technologies. We can build build back better because that is the name. So we not even build back better. We don't have any. So when we have this developmental spurt, we can go ahead and invest in these things. Now it's all a question of how do you get the financing for this? How does this work? It will be viable because it will not be as expensive as the ones before. Now the question is in India, uh, because Subindu and we keep discussing this, that there is this thing called Unfortunately, we Indians are more shop. We are we like we go and buy technology going to a shop to buy. Yeah, we are more yeah, shopkeeper yeah. approach. We have of buying technology and think technology transfer will happen. Technology transfer will never happen because core technologies will always be there. In fact, I was trying to find out that they have said that in the Cochin shipyard, the uh, the Norwegians have given the latest autonomous ship to construct. I dug a little deeper and I found out. But only level one, level one automation is there for to be built in India. The real heart of the black box is not going to be done here. It will be done there. So you, the transfer technology won't happen. You know, you will be pushed down unless we do our R and D, unless the government, yes. the academic institutions, and youngsters and startups come together and have an ecosystem. There is no roadmap possible. Government cannot do it. We don't have that cluster-wise ecosystem. Is my feeling. Every other developed country, I've been working for a Norwegian company for a lot. They've got innovation funds. It is not a wonder that guy who made that, uh, that small thing is a Norwegian who made the presentation on that energy converter. Wonderful concept. But I'm 100% sure he does not have the uh, market, but he has the idea. Subendu has been involved in many water projects. Maybe I would like you to you know, say about this big pitfall in our our thinking uh, yeah. in the country. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, I have been involved in a micro, uh, ultra low head uh, micro hydro technology, which we were thinking of bringing in from uh, Switzerland. So the beauty of this technology is that it generates power at uh, in uh, run of the river streams with even a head less than one meter. Now, when the, so this was unheard of when we presented it before Rurki and all. So we tried to bring it here in, but then. So although we are so enthusiastic about innovation, the moment I take it to any government agency or anyone, the first thing they ask is that, have you done it in India? So we said, <laughs> sir, this is an innovation. It's not there anywhere in India. I said, okay, so then do the first thing for first one for me for free, because you know, it's an innovation. It might not, it might work in Switzerland. It's not going to work in India. So, uh, so do it for free for me. And then when, it, when I see that it works well, then I'm going to pay you for the rest. And you know, if you do it here in, the whole world is going to know. And they're just my reference is going to get you so many projects. I've heard it so many times in corporates. You know, they want these to be done free. No one wants to take the risk of an innovation project. Although they will say, they talk about innovation a lot. 
Yeah. I was also working with another company. I was not working, trying to bring in another technology about uh, air to water solution. That is making drinking water out of air. Now, the cost is prohibitively high. Whereas when we inquired, we found out 70% of the components which go into this air to technology in Canada is from India. So the moment the, the thing which costs one rupee, uh, when it goes to Canada, gets assembled and then you import it back to India, it, it becomes seven rupees, you know, one rupee thing. So he said, why do you want to bring, you know, make, you know, bring up the price to this manner? Let's make it in India. So you have 70% of the components already in India. I said, no, 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 it's not going to happen. I'm not going to tell you what's inside. It's, it's a, basically a, a sealed container wherein you just switch it on. It's a plug and play solution. Now we're going to give it to you just like that, but then we don't want to give you the core, the crux of the technology, which is inside. Now that is, that has been my experience in innovation that we have everything, but then if we can do it, yes, there are companies already in India who are working on air to water and delivering. But then you'll have some differences in the efficiencies and all and others that we will come up to that point. But then these are the main barriers that we face when we bring in innovation and technology transfer does not happen in that manner in, because in the micro hydro project, what we understood is that they had a concept. They did not have a technology. They wanted to play it on us to figure out what the technology, how it can be modified, what can be the streamlining. And the moment it uh, went to a point where they understood that we know more about the technology than they do, they pulled out. So that's what happened. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah. that's very yeah. nice. I think it, it has gone on very well. I, I don't think there are any other questions. If I can have uh, just a couple of points to make. Uh, one is NIOT, I understand, has been working on many of these technologies in the ocean sector. And uh, and in, including the OTEC. And uh, during my uh, tenure, I, I was involved personally with one project on one OTEC project uh, that was uh, with NIOT. The basic technology for, was with NIOT, and we were designing the uh, platform, the floating platform in almost two, uh, two kilometers water, water depth. That was to, uh, to generate fresh water uh, for. Tamil Nadu, which uh, suffers from water shortage uh, substantially. Uh, the uh, feed work was completed. Uh, I don't think that has really uh, taken off thereafter. We could possibly generate fresh water, uh, portable water, uh, to a substantial amount at a price level, which is quite comparable. Now, uh, okay, all I say, all I, say I, I think we should. Uh, now, uh, hear from Admiral Kandan, uh, his observations and his ideas, and, uh, and we can then generally conclude the session. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, we'll, we'll do the Thanksgiving subsequently at the last year. So you need to unmute yourself. You're still muted, sir. You're, you're on mute, sir. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. Thank you very much for the last group. I want to also thank you for the very generous introduction which you had done earlier. Um, no. Now, first of all, I would like to congratulate these two speakers. Yes. Uh, they had uh, shared their very vast experience and their in-depth knowledge on a very complex topic, which covers a whole lot of sectors uh, when you look from implementation point of view. Uh, I could uh, see that the evolution of this problem over the last 30 years was very nicely covered. And today we have come to uh, understanding the concept of uh, carbon footprint, carbon trading, how you can, uh, as, a, as a international community, how we're able to uh, control this to the desired level so that you don't have... Uh, adverse impacts uh, in the case that uh, very very little time frame is left. We have, people are talking about 15 years, 20 years left. And I hope uh, uh, there is success uh, in all these missions which have to be uh, launched. 
as I said earlier, this is a very complex topic and there has to be a lot of coordination between various uh, sectors when you want to implement this. But for today's uh, uh, topic being more with uh, shipping and shipping related issues and some energy related issues, I would like to just uh, uh, touch upon uh, some of the important points which had come and some of the developments which are taking place parallelly uh, on, from the government side or from the various institutions. But before I do that, I need to uh, thank Krishna Kumar and uh, Subedru uh, for, I did not know that hydrogen came in three colors. Uh, today I came to know it, there is a color for hydrogen, green, blue, gray, based on its origin and the effort which somebody has put to produce a hydrogen. I'm very happy to see that uh, the concept of door-to-door -door shipping is uh, evolved, which makes it uh, an overall estimation of the uh, uh, carbon uh, involved in uh, doing this activity. Some of the uh, videos which they had shown were very good, but it suddenly reminded me a lot of submarine technology is coming into uh, these applications, uh, be it batteries driven ships, uh, fuel cells driven ships. Uh, much of this has come from, I've initially come in the submarine world who had this natural restriction. They could not breathe air and nor could they exhale into atmosphere. So they were uh, compelled to find technological solutions to run with uh, resources which, which does not permit them to access from atmosphere or free uh, releasing of your fumes into atmosphere when they're underwater. So I, I'm happy that uh, some of these technologies have come, they have got modified and uh, they are being developed in many um, countries abroad. And uh, hopefully some of these things we will uh, see in India as well. So as I said earlier, let me just quickly um, uh, group my um, uh, comments on, I will go ship wise a little bit, then I will say what happens on land to support the ships and some of the government policies which are in the offing. And finally, if there's time, I'll just touch upon two technologies which I suddenly reminded after seeing Krishna Kumar's slide of the Indian Ocean. So I will just touch upon this in the end. We are, as far as ship-related issues are concerned, we are, we are very clear our ships need to comply with the new uh, levels of GGH and uh, carbon emissions. And uh, we have very little time of 10 to 15 years to achieve them. Actually, by 2030, we had to achieve them. So it's very little time. It's actually a race against time. Um, some of, if you look at our asset holding uh, in um, India, uh, we have got a lot of old ships and therefore uh, it may not be worth it modifying them to meet the new standards. And Krishna Kumar rightly brought out, it's an advantage for us. It's an opportunity for us. We, anyway, our assets are old. They are not going to perform even after the retrofitment of some equipment that they will meet the new standards. So it may be a good idea to um, uh, go in for the new technology, for the new acquisitions, which are going to, which have to anyway come to replace them. So I think that's a very good uh, approach. But more from the designer point of view, I think there are many designers in today's audience. They need to look at how ships can be made more green. Uh, ships will have to be more green, basically from their, what type of fuel they're going to use and what type of speed characteristics they're going to uh, generate. I think there's going to be uh, some restrictions on these aspects, uh, but the designers have got a big role now to play. It is not going to be just uh, replicating some of the conventional designs, which were running with uh, actually engine room uh, machinery, uh, where you had, they say it's going to be piston free ships. They're not going to be any rotating machinery uh, inside the ship, except for uh, uh, some, um, ex will be there for generation of power. So there is a, uh, there is a shift which has come in, uh, in the ship design. As I understand, 
the ships are going to get bigger because there is more volume within their hull. But they are going to become slower because uh, they have to carry a bigger tonnage and the propulsion which is going to be there may not be able to give them the type of uh, uh, speeds which we are seeing today. So it's going to be a trade-off between uh, commercial aspects which, which goes with quick turnaround, uh, less passage time, etc. We shall be environmental care. And uh, if the new technologies are going to come in, I think LNG ships are going to be the immediate substitutes. So I think uh, uh, as far as India is concerned, as far as Indian designers are concerned, uh, we need to look at uh, how LNG can be brought into our um, uh, our uh, shipping fraternity in a bigger way and how they can be supported from land. Now, let's look at the points as far as land-centric points are concerned. I think our ports need to be giving a more greener support to ships. Uh, ships, as soon as they come, should get their uh, power supply from shore. They need not run their um, generators, which is the case now, except in... Um, uh, Chidambaram uh, port where which has started giving power to all the ships which are coming. The crafts run by, uh, the tugs run by the port should be more eco-friendly, therefore they should be preferably LNG run. Uh, the port system should be, uh, the port support system should be more efficient to minimize turnaround time of ships. I think we are doing something like 25 to 26 hours now, they need to come down so that ships don't spend much time in the port, they are back to sea. And uh, the unloading time has to be significantly crunched. Uh, somebody had done a study between uh, Japan and us, and they found that uh, uh, our cranes can make only 20 moves in one hour, but in Japan it is almost the double. So they unload much faster, uh, unload and load uh, much faster. So the turnaround time of ships is less. As I mentioned earlier, LNG could be an answer. Therefore, the port should have LNG bunkering facility, which is not there in, uh, uh, except in one or two ports today. Uh, we don't have LNG bunkering facility. And the ports of services should be also electrical vehicles driven so that uh, there is uh, pollution control, better waste collection, etc. In short, Ports need to align themselves to the goals of sustainable development goals of 2015, the SDG 15, 2015 goals, uh, where there is a specific uh, chapter on uh, industry, innovation, infrastructure. I think they need to look at uh, this very closely and plan their changes in infrastructure, augmentation of infrastructure. Of course, they should also look at solar power and wind power for their requirements. Uh, and uh, thereby the ports are more green, the ships are more green, therefore the ship operations as well as the port operations support whatever is the requirement uh, for uh, meeting our uh, environmental care mission. Uh, thank you Mr. Das Gupta for the book which you gave me on uh, Marine India Vision 2030. I just want to share with the audience, uh, this is a wonderful book and uh, the government's initiatives, planned initiatives are very well captured in that document. And I'm sure uh, this document, which has been benchmarked for all the new environmental norms of uh, global greenhouse uh, emission and carbon emission, et cetera, have been taken into account. So therefore, a, there is a blueprint available in India how for the next 10 years we are able to launch the various missions towards controlling and achieving the targets which we are set upon. I just also want to add, I think the government has taken a decision that you can't buy a second-hand ship anymore from abroad and bring it to India to operate unless it complies with DGS norms, some phase two of DGS norms. Another aspect is they are extending right of first refusal uh, uh, to uh, Indian ship hold, uh, ship owners as well as Indian shipyards that you cannot 
get a ship from abroad to operate within and ships built in India, ships flagged in India will get priority. So all this would put in a lot of uh, increase in scaling of operations on shipbuilding or ship operations and port operations, etc. Of course, if you, are, you can still import a ship from abroad, but your customs duty is going to be enhanced. So financially, it will be difficult for you to do it. So essentially, the shift has been to increase scale of operation in the marines, the maritime sector, so that all the money which you're going to invest in increasing the efficiency or environment friendly nature of your infrastructure, of your ships, etc., are becoming financially viable. You raise the scale of operations. I think this uh, government policy, which has been uh, documented in this uh, vision document, I think has come out very well. And I hope uh, these things get implemented. Uh, these are only initiatives at the moment as a blueprint. They have to be followed up with uh, orders and rules and regulations, etc. And I hope that will happen in quick time. So overall, uh, we have got a huge task in front of us. There are government ideas, uh, initiatives which are in place, which can be uh, implemented. And we should be able to reach our uh, destination, which is going to be uh, carbon uh, free, at least to a certain level uh, in the next 10 years or so. Now, uh, if I can take two more minutes, if you don't mind, can I just take on the technology, which I, uh, okay. I, I saw that uh, picture of, uh, uh, of the Indian Ocean and uh, where there was one small little mention about hydrates on the east coast of uh, India. I just want to share with you that uh, the continental shelf uh, structure in the east coast has got a large number of hydrates located within and the methane which is contained in those hydrates are uh, sufficient to meet our energy requirements for many years, even a few decades. It is estimated it is five times energy equivalent of the coal uh, with us in India. As such, coal with us in India is quite, uh, quite a lot. So there's a lot of energy lying in the hydrates in the East Coast. But how to get the methane out and uh, the technology has to be uh, demonstrated first. Uh, Japan has done it, Korea has done it. What they plan to do is, and there's a double whammy for uh, containing carbon on earth. And therefore it is very relevant to today's discussion. What they plan to do is, they absorb the carbon dioxide on, on the surface, compress it, and make it liquid carbon dioxide. Obviously, uh, some energy is spent on this, or it will be green energy. This liquid carbon dioxide is taken to the bottom of the continental shelf, where methane is lying within the hydrates. So you do sequestration of the methane. If you just pull out the methane from that, the hydrates will collapse. So what they do is they pull out the methane and put liquid carbon dioxide inside. So what happens is the hydrates don't get uh, uh, destroyed. Methane is taken out and poor carbon dioxide from Earth has gone into that. So it's double whammy for uh, energy scientists that we got methane by giving carbon dioxide. It's a wonderful idea, and I think the uh, concept is getting uh, demonstrated sometime in, uh, in a couple of years in Japan, and hopefully uh, we, we should be able to uh, also catch up with this technology. So that is one part of the hydrates which I saw in the slide, very important to uh, controlling uh, carbon uh, uh, on the surface. The second point, which is also on there's a small spec saying where uh, deep sea mining was mentioned. Just want to tell this audience 
uh, India has been given uh, nearly 75,000 uh, square kilometers on the international seabed, but quite far from uh, our uh, boundaries, about 2,500 kilo miles away. Uh, and we are supposed to do uh, some ocean mining. Uh, we have done it till about uh, 6,000 uh, uh, feet with the help of NIOT. You had mentioned about NIOT. They have done some wonderful job in this. But to do the, the depths at uh, the place where we are being given the international seabed is uh, much more. So technologies have to be developed to do how we can do the mining from there. So for many of the designers who are, going, who are there in this audience, a lot of emphasis is going to come on deep sea submerging, submerging vessels. Vessels which can go to great depths, maybe unmanned and perhaps at a later date manned, which will be able to um, undertake scientific missions first and thereafter uh, do on a commercial scale uh, mining from uh, the ocean bed. Our ocean has got a lot of wealth in these areas and I hope uh, some of the young um, engineers who are in the audience, some of the young designers who are in this audience would, uh, would, would have an opportunity to um, deal with this uh, new uh, technology which is going to come in. In India, we have not done it so far. Even NIOT, whatever platform they have made, they have made it open cage uh, platform. So it is not a closed uh, hull where which can go to that depth. They have made it open, but hopefully in the years to come, it will come out. So overall, it has been a very, uh, very interesting discussion. And uh, I want to thank once again the two speakers for having shared with us uh, their uh, insight, their knowledge, and some experience they have had in developing new technologies by which uh, we would have less carbon uh, in, on our earth surface, in our air we breathe, uh, and as well as we'll have a more uh, healthy life. I also want to thank Professor Bondel, who had uh, 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 steered this uh, presentation as well as the Q&A session. I really enjoyed Of course, I didn't get much time to uh, interact with him. I hope uh, I will get that opportunity at a later time. So once again, uh, thanks to INA, for having given this opportunity for me to interact with you. A lot of young minds are there in your group and also with you, Mr. Das Gupta, I uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, I'm very thankful to you uh, for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, Professor Mandal. Do you have any, any comments uh, to offer further, Professor Mandal? Uh, um, actually, very nicely summed up by Admiral Kanan, definitely. Uh, so, um, I would simply like to thank uh, Shivendu and Mr. Krishna Kumar both for, for, for enlightening us with various aspects. Really, really thankful very much. Only uh, one small aspect I, I would like to comment on uh, Admiral Karnan's this thing. And not only on Admiral Karnan, we have been talking about it. that is, uh, as somewhere it has been mentioned, that all wealth is there in the ocean. Right, ocean uh, huge wealth is there. So, well, uh, one of the aspects is uh, deep sea mining. This talk was going on for last few decades. Uh, I remember in IIT Kharagpur uh, when I joined immediately after that, way back in '87, uh, we, we had been talking about ocean mining, but nothing much progressed. Unfortunately, what we see, not unfortunately, I mean, nothing progressed, but uh, there is a Another aspect to it, another dimension. All these we are doing for 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 making it green, for making the uh, earth, our planet more sustainable, more viable for the future generation. Now, people, uh, the environmental people, they uh, they are vehemently against, if you are aware, against ocean mining, because what they say has to say. Because I have been a little bit looking into that of late. Uh, with respect to IIT Gohati's project, that uh, any ocean mining we do, it will not be in a small scale, whatever the industrial scale we do, that, that may damage the ecosystem. 
and 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 in the in those great depths of the ocean the process is very slow the regeneration process so this may lead to a very uh, so there there are talks of in the some part of the ocean and uh, that uh, a, a united nations imposed moratorium may come in place they cannot do anything anyway so th there are many issues in any case it's as i said it's a vast ocean and um, quite a bit of enlightenment we had today to this thing and can go on and on so yeah. uh, we'll stop this, thank this, you all very is, much thank you very much uh, thank Jepishon. you very much i'll, I'll take you. a little more time sir if you if you permit sure i hope you are free we yeah. have amongst us one of the most senior most uh, maritime professionals in india uh, mr r l pai uh yeah amir uh, can you unmute uh, mr pai and he ha he has made a question mm. so if it, if uh, mr pai you, you can unmute yourself and come on video and uh, make a comment yeah yeah that we yeah there's a question by him mm -hmm. mr pai has made uh, you know lifetime contribution to marine engineering and uh, you know in reliance is one of the senior most maritime professionals we have here yeah we have we have uh, mr pai in the panel right now uh, mr pai can you uh, yeah. try to unmute yourself yeah. Yeah. is he there Yeah. Maybe, no. maybe he is there. there. Why, Mr. Pai is there in the meeting? I think I'll read out the question so that um, yes. you can oh. take it forward. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's a comment actually. Yes. Um, Mr. Pai says that my question relates to IMO and the MEPC in particular. The entire issue of tangible measures to reduce the carbon footprint from ships has been delegated to IMO. Unfortunately, as IMO is an intergovernmental organization. there are geopolitical issues at stake which are driven more by shipyards ship operators and producers of fossil fuels at mepc meetings a fourth of the delegates are represented by these stakeholders the end result of this is the targeted measures are postponed at successive meetings the eexi and eedi guidelines are stark examples of this approach of imo unless this changes there is little prospect of improving this situation and uh, yes sir yes sir yeah so yeah. mr pai would you like to add anything more yeah um yeah uh, thank you very much there has been a small power failure at admiral kandan's uh, place so he is joining joining back uh, in a while uh in the meanwhile i would uh, ask one question uh, to both mr krishna kumar and to mr biswas uh, we haven't touched upon the concept of uh, carbon capture in your presentation so i understand this is going to be one of the uh, major issues and already implemented on land based installations so we'll uh, possibly have a separate session on this and uh, i'm sure with your experience you would and uh, background uh, from middle east where it is well implemented the carbon capture will also find a place uh, in the entire scheme of things do you hear okay. me yes sir we can hear you yes, thank you sir. okay thank okay. you for right. coming back yes uh, mr pai is uh, apparently not available so i think we had a wonderful session <laughs> Very Mr. Pai, Mr. Pai is an old colleague of mine. Uh, I know him very well. I was looking forward to seeing him as well. Yes. Um, I think he was in Lassen Tubro many many years ago. Yes. And uh, then, but uh, that was much before uh, uh, I had joined. But we are together in I think uh, uh, Lloyd's um, uh, South Asian uh, Committee. Okay. Together. Yeah. So that's why I have met him uh, for the last five years. We are together in that committee. Yes, yes. Yep. He is one of the yep. most and most knowledgeable person yes, yes, in the very yes. time fraternity. Yep. Uh, anyway, I think we should uh, bring this uh, lovely session <laughs> to close. Thank you very much for, on a personal level to Mr. Krishna Kumar and uh, Mr. Biswas. Uh, 
can Kamanda Kapli uh, propose a vote of thanks, please? Yes. Uh, uh, good okay. evening, uh, Commander Manohar Kapli here. Uh, I'll uh, begin with uh, our chief guest, Admiral Kannan, who was my boss once upon a time. And uh, we have worked uh, together for uh, many years. So, so it was a pleasure to see you in this session. And uh, it was a pleasure to listen to you. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for taking off your time and for uh, gracing a session by uh, Institution of Naval Architects. You know, Professor N. R. Manjil is a respected name in uh, the Naval Architectural Fraternity. He has been guru to many of the people who have joined this session today. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for agreeing to come to this session. And uh, um, our speakers have done a wonderful job. Innovation is the only way ahead. And the clips which they have shown, those will stay with me for a very long time. And I'm sure with many of the audience for a very long time. And uh, will give us a lot to think. So uh, Mr. Krishna Kumar and Mr. Shubhendu Bishwas, thank you so much. And we hope that we will be able to have some more sessions with you in future. The most important part of these sessions are the audience. And we had a huge audience here, many people on Zoom and many people on YouTube. So both put together, uh, we have a healthy attendance today. Uh, so uh, my uh, deep appreciation to everybody. And uh, these sessions are monthly sessions from Institution of Naval Architects. We will very soon announce the topic as well as date for the session in the month of July. And uh, um, uh, we hope to see everybody uh, together again. And also we request um, everybody to please uh, spread the word around about these monthly technical sessions of INA. In the uh, executive committee of INA, I will uh, like to thank my entire executive committee colleagues, including uh, Mr. Das Gupta, Amir, and Kamaru uh, Sujit Bakshi, who have been instrumental in organizing this session, and Selvi at the back end coordinating everything. And uh, with this, uh, I would wish that uh, everybody please take care uh, during this uh, tough time of Corona, stay healthy, and uh, hope to see you again next month. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.